everyone, welcome back. I'm Michael Sandler, your host on Inspire Nation. And if you've ever wanted more time in your day, then do we have the Make Time Show for you. Today I'll be talking with John Zaratsky, the best-selling co-author of Sprint, along with Jake Knapp, and the co-author of a new favorite book on time, Make Time. And that's just what I want to talk with him about today, about how to bulldoze your calendar and focus on what matters every day. That, plus we'll talk about Obi-Wan, plaid shirts, and the system, grandma <laughs> and cheerleading, binge-watching Stranger Things, a do-it-yourself turndown service, Matt Shoby and Bastille Day, 5K that is, what on earth is a caffeine nap, and what in the world a sailboat named Pineapple has to do with anything. <laughs> gotcha. So welcome to the show, John. Are you ready to shine? Hell yeah. I'm Woo ready. <laughs> <laughs> so before we dive right into things, can you tell us about how life was when you were snowbound in Chicago in early 2008? Yeah, I'd be happy to. Uh, I, in 2008, my company, the company I worked for had just been acquired by Google and it was a tech startup and, and for a tech person being acquired by Google is kind of the, a dream come true. Um, it means that you, you were successful, your idea was validated and, and Google is a pretty great place to work. So I was in my mid twenties. I was, uh, I had this great job. I was living with my girlfriend who's now my wife. Yeah. Uh, life was good, but despite all the good things going on, I woke up one day in the middle of a dark and dreary winter in Chicago, and I just had this feeling that time was slipping away. It was flying by. I, I couldn't really remember what had happened the last couple of months. If you'd asked me, what'd you do this weekend or, or what'd you do on Thursday? I would have drawn a blank. I wouldn't have known really um, what was going on, what I was spending my time on. Um, and, and that didn't, that didn't sit right with me, it, you know, all, all these good things were going on, but, yeah. but somehow it felt like I couldn't really hold on to them. And so how did that begin to change or when did you start working for YouTube? Uh, I started working for YouTube a couple of years after that. Yeah. Um, my wife and I grew up in the Midwest. We're both from Wisconsin and we lived in Chicago after college. A lot of people, we went to University of Wisconsin. A lot of people then moved down to Chicago. Um, and, and then a couple of years after that, we had the opportunity to move to the Bay Area, to San Francisco uh, and work at YouTube. So in between then, you must have started your own time experiments. Yeah, that's right. I had already at this point become uh, rather obsessed with productivity. I thought that that was the best way to make good use of my time. Um, I remember when I was a kid, I, um, I grew up before the internet. I'm, I'm just old enough. I'm 35. I'm just old enough to, to really have, you know, uh, have had a childhood without the internet, without computers. And I just remember that feeling of being a kid, you know, kind of a nerdy kid yep. sitting in my room, just, pouring my energy into some hobby or activity. Um, and it's like there was nothing else in the world. And a lot of what I've been doing as an adult is trying to get back to that feeling because uh, life, of course, life gets more complicated for all of us as we grow up and we have responsibilities and things. But but the world has gotten so much more complicated. There's so many more um, sources of information or entertainment. There's uh, technologies that bring infinity to our pockets. Uh, we have workplaces that expect us and require us to be online all the time, to be responsive at every moment. Um, and so I've always kind of been thinking about these things. And, and, and as, as you pointed out, you know, early in my career in Chicago, I was trying to be as productive as possible. But as I found then when I had that experience of not really remembering what was going on, I learned that productivity wasn't the answer. It just sort of made the time fly by in a blur. Yeah, and it's fascinating. You write about that in the book. The more productive you were, the less it seemed that you would remember what happened. It's, to me, if you want to actually experience time and savor time, you have to put the pause in there or else the more productive you are, the more it goes at lightning speed. Yeah, that's totally true. And it, 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 honestly, it took me a while to figure that out. Uh, af after this experience in the, in the winter of 2008, I thought, well, productivity is not working. Maybe I should um, 
maybe I should set some goals. You know, there's a lot of books about these kind of things, about mapping out where you want your life to go. And so I would write down one year goals and three year goals and five year goals. And, uh, and that didn't help either. That just, that felt bad, but in a different way, instead of being so in the weeds and kind of having time go by in a blur with the goals, it was like, they were so far away. It was like, one day I'll be good enough. One day I'll get there. Um, but, but what am I doing right now? What's, you know, what's, what's good about my life right now? And so, um, ultimately I found that kind of the, the middle road, um, the space in between the little tasks and the big goals was where I could find, uh, meaning day in and day out. And where if I focused on those in between activities, that's what made me feel like I was making good use of my time. And it made me feel like, to your point, I could, I could savor that time. I could really live in it instead of uh, just kind of watching it fly by. I love it. I'm thinking about you, what you said, in between in the middle road. And I'm thinking about now the um, uh, Buddha and time management. Yeah. You know, I have not studied Buddhism at all, but you are the second person in the last week to mention the idea. I, I think it's that called the, the middle road. Is mm -hmm. that correct? Yeah. Middle road or middle path, absolutely, and and it is it is taking a path between the two extremes that where um, where you probably savor life the most, as you put it. Right. Yeah. And you know, I probably should have just read some uh, some books about Buddhism, and I could have figured that out. But <laughs> but instead, I had to sort of bumble my way through it. And uh, and it, what ended up happening in two thousand eight was that um, I didn't have some amazing epiphany or some discovery. Um, instead, the the winter ended and spring arrived, <laughs> as it always does. Yeah. Uh, and, and the sun was shining, and the the birds were singing, and and everywhere. But I feel like especially in the Midwest. Um, people really come out of their shells or come out of their caves when spring arrives and they start to get social and make plans. And that's what happened to me. I, I um, had a bunch of fun stuff going on. For example, I had a group of friends. We would meet for lunch every week uh, across town. And, and, and on those days, I made sure that I had planned my day around enjoying that lunch. I would make sure that I, I had my morning scheduled so I could leave on time and that I didn't have to you know, eat in a rush and race back to the office, um, kind of build my day around that, that one thing that I wanted to look forward to. And I started to think of even my, my work in the office in the same way. If I had like a presentation to, to create that I was going to be giving instead of the typical way that we do work in the office, which is to try to squeeze things into the spaces in between meetings and emails, right? To kind of slice things up and, and work from a to-do list. I would, I would take this medium sized project and I would say, you know what, uh, Wednesday morning or, or, or Friday afternoon, I'm just going to focus on that one project. And that gave me the same kind of meaning in my work as I was getting from these, these really fun things I was doing outside the office. I call that the SMP, your single minded purpose. What's yeah. that one thing you want to get done today above and beyond all else that will make you, it can move the needle forward, but will make you feel good. That's exactly right. Down. Yeah. And, and, and Jake, my, my co-author and I, um, we call it your highlight. So the idea is if you were to ask yourself at the end of the day, what was the highlight of my day? Mm -hmm. What do you want that answer to be? You can kind of reverse engineer a good day by structuring everything around one really meaningful, important, fun, um, worthwhile activity. And the way that I kind of approach it in my days is like, even if everything else is crazy, even if, um, even if the day doesn't go quite the way I want it to, if I made time for that highlight, I'm still going to feel good about how I spent my time. I love it. So on that note, how did you meet Jake and how did you guys start becoming, uh, I'm going to probably get it wrong, but uh, I'll say time dorks together. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Um, well, Jake and I met at Google Ventures, which is a, a division of Google that invests in outside startups. Yeah. So um, every year, a, a little bit of Google's extra money, the money they're making actually gets reinvested into um, all, si all sorts of companies that are, that are outside Google, that are unaffiliated. And Jake and I, we both had the same job at Google Ventures, which was to go after we had made an investment and work with these startups like sort of a consultant. Mm -hmm. 
And, uh, and, and we both have backgrounds in design and in writing. So we'd kind of go in and talk to them about how their product was designed or their web page or their app or their marketing or whatever. But we started to see that um, everybody, even at the most cutting edge sophisticated companies, they struggled with the same challenges that we had seen with our time, which was how do you make time for the work that is most important um, when so much of your day is being driven by defaults? and by the expectations and demands of other people. You, you have a job as, you know, we were both designers and you have a job to design things, but it sometimes seems like there's no time to actually do your work at work. You have to wait till the end of the day or you have to try to squeeze it in. And so we both really wanted to, to help people overcome this challenge. And, and, and we had come from it, um, come at it from different places. Jake, uh, is a father. He has two boys and, um, and, and he shared with me many times the experience and it's, it's in the book too, but the experience of how having his first son really, uh, you know, made it clear to him that, uh, that time was, was passing by time was moving in one direction and, and he wanted to be there and he wanted to enjoy that time with his son. We just found out we're pregnant uh, a week ago, oh, like a week ago yesterday. And, yeah. and it is becoming abundantly clear. I do this exercise called automatic writing each morning. You go quiet, you listen, you get words. And what I got is everything moving forward, forward, you will partner with somebody else. Time just became so much more precious. Yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah. So, so Jake and I, we, we both wanted to help, uh, these teams, uh, that we were working with do the work that matters, make good use of their time. And uh, the way, one of the ways that we did that was with something called the design sprint. Mm -hmm. And this is a, a five-day step-by-step process that a team can use when they're working on something new mm -hmm. that will uh, take them all the way from generating new ideas through uh, turning those ideas into a prototype that they can put in front of customers. And it helps teams cut through all the crap that normally happens at work, and it helps them uh, figure out in just a few days what might otherwise take weeks or months or sometimes even years to figure out, which is what are your customers going to think of this thing that you're doing? So Jake and I ha had the opportunity to run like more than 150 of these sprints with the companies that we were working with. And each one was like a little experiment. It was like we were in the laboratory, we were sort of testing out these ideas and we were understanding that, for example, people uh, could get so much more done and enjoy themselves so much more when they focused on one thing at a time. And people's energy and their ability to focus and do good work was directly related to how well they took care of their their bodies, you know, having breaks and eating good food and being well rested and not working super long hours. And all the things that we were learning in the design sprints um, just sort of were folded back into the personal experiments that Jake and I were doing to try to uh, make good use of our time as individuals. Beautiful. So I want to talk more about time sprints in, in a little bit. Before we do sure. that, you mentioned yeah. a key concept. I want to get some big picture concepts here. One key yeah. one, you said, we're operating by default. Yeah. What does that mean? Because we don't even realize this. Yeah. And that was a huge, um, a huge realization for us um, that everything from our, our phones to our computers to our uh, workplace cultures, the expectations that we have, those things are, are they, they just work in a certain way. And that way wasn't necessarily designed or intentionally put into place by anybody. So for example, um, why are all meetings 30 or 60 minutes? You know, like there's no real obvious reason for that, especially when, when a lot of meetings that you have would be better off either canceled outright or turned into a five minute quick chat, or maybe on the other, uh, other end of the spectrum turned into a, a three hour session where you could actually deeply work on something, um, in a collaborative way. Um, there's an expectation that when somebody sends you an email, you're going to see it right away. You're going to respond to it. That's sort of the default mode. And when you get a new smartphone, by default, it's got 
email pre-installed on it. By default, it's going to check for new email all the time and it's going to show you a notification. It's going to make a sound or it's going to buzz um, when you have a new email. And these, the way that things are, these defaults aren't in line with how most of us want to be spending our time. They just kind of are, um, but they're not set in stone. They're not fixed things. We can actually change the defaults. And I think realizing that that these defaults exist and that they're changeable is kind of the key to unlocking the the process by which you can start to take control of your energy and your attention. Oh, it's interesting. My wife has a new cell phone coming in today. Today, part of the whole pregnancy thing is we got a lower EMF phone for her. Oh wow! And yeah, it'll be interesting what we put and and a, a EMF blocking case on it as well. I don't actually use a smartphone. Because I found years ago the smartphone was a way to lose myself and yeah. lose my time. And so yeah. I went that direction because it was just too easy. Now, we do have her phone available, but sure. it keeps me. And I like what you both did. I guess Jake did it first, and then you followed suit. Yeah. And you've kind of, I'll call it dumbed down, but maybe we can call it cleaned up your <laughs> smartphone. Yeah. yeah. So we, we both have what we call a distraction-free phone which um, which is a, a smartphone, a modern, up-to-date smartphone. In fact, Jake just got the, the brand newest iPhone. Um, my phone's a couple years old, but it's still, it's a very, very fancy phone. Um, but it involves taking a smartphone and removing all of what we call the Infinity Pool apps. So that's any app that has an endless and automatically replenishing source of content. So... Uh, Twitter and Facebook and Instagram, things like that. Um, anything that streams video like Netflix or YouTube and, and things that seem productive but often uh, aren't so much like email um, that, and, and chat applications. Uh, um, basically, all those things that can create the feeling, like you said, of, of sort of losing yourself, of, of you know, maybe picking up your phone to do a quick check of something and then half an hour realizing, whoa, like what just happened? That wasn't a quick check. Like I just spent half an hour mindlessly scrolling through the, the Instagram feed. Um, so our philosophy is that to, to sort of um, reclaim control of your attention, the key is to make it more difficult to get distracted, not to try to develop willpower, not to try to be stronger or have more discipline, but to actually just remove the temptation uh, entirely. And the reason that we like to do that on a smartphone is that there's a lot of other really cool smart things that smartphones oh, yeah. can do. I mean, they have great cameras. You can use Lyft or Uber to get a ride. You can use Google Maps to navigate. You can listen to music and podcasts like this one. Um, there's so many neat things that they can do. And, and to us, it seemed like a shame to just uh, throw away all that cool stuff. Um, but what we want to do with the distraction-free phone is kind of have the best of, of both worlds. But you want to be in control of your time rather than giving it away to everyone and everything else. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, we want um, we want the decisions that we make about our time to be intentional. We want to be purposeful with how we spend our time, not merely productive for the sake of of you know of productivity. That makes sense. So on that note. What is, and we're going to dive in after this into all some sorts of specifics here, but what is mm -hmm. the busy bandwagon and how do we start to jump off of this? <laughs> yeah. So I, I mentioned the infinity pools. Mm -hmm. That is, uh, that, that is one kind of set of defaults that exist. The, all these apps that are considered very normal to have these on your phone, to have these open on your computer all the time. Um, and that's sort of the, that's sort of the free time side of things. That's yeah. the, you know, that's the entertainment. That's what you do on a break. But, uh, on, but there's this other force that we call the busy bandwagon, mm -hmm. um, which is equally as challenging as the infinity pools. Um, and that is the, culture of constant busyness. It's the expectation that you will always be online, that you're going to see that new message right away. You're going to reply immediately. You're going to stay on top of all the projects and all the messages about all the projects at all times. Um, and, and this is maybe even worse than, uh, than the infinity pools because it feels like it's what we're supposed to do. It feels very productive. It, we have a lot of, um, I think, 
Uh, we have a lot of myths in in our culture about what it means to be a grown up, you know, to be sort of a uh, an adult productive member of society. Um, and so the busy bandwagon and the infinity pools are both these very powerful defaults that really, if we're not thoughtful about it, end up really controlling how we spend the, the, the bulk of our time. There's a, a fantastic quote from Jake in the book. Being more productive didn't mean I was doing the most important work. It only meant I was reacting to other people's priorities faster. Other people's priorities. Yeah, that's especially true when it comes to email. And and I'm sorry for continually ragging on email because you know email is very useful and I, and I certainly use it a lot. Um, but uh, but I, I saw somewhere uh, somebody described um, email as like a, to, a an insane person's to do list. You know, it's like a it's like a to do list infinity pool. Yeah, it's like an it's like a to do list that is entirely uh, populated by other people's to dos. You know, other people put stuff on your list, um, and and yeah, I mean, Jake and I both used to follow this sort of doctrine of inbox zero, which is this idea that every day you should you should process through all of the messages in your inbox, um, kind of get them out of sight, out of mind, but uh, then it. The, the work of dealing with your inbox ends up replacing the work that you're supposed to be doing by using email. Um, so uh, it's just like Jake wrote, you know, the, 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 you know, being more productive really just means responding to other people's priorities. Um, if you get through 200 emails by the end of the day, that's not necessarily a good day. Well, as a designer, you got through your 200 emails, you have an inbox zero, and then you go, now when do I have time to design? Yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah. So let's let's talk about four key steps, the whole backbone yeah. to this book, which I absolutely love, and we're going to rinse and repeat every day. Highlight, laser, energize, reflect. Yeah, that's right. So we wanted to create something that was not a one size fits all formula. We didn't want to tell people if you do these these 13 things every day your life is going to be perfect. We wanted to have a very basic, very simple, lightweight um type of framework, um really something that's that's flexible and forgiving. And and what we found as we kind of dissected what had worked for us and what had what we learned from talking to other people was that if you can start each day with a highlight, something that you want to make time for. If you can find ways to uh, beat distraction and take control of your attention so that you have laser-like focus, if you can make sure that you're always building energy by taking care of yourself, taking care of your body, and then if you can, at the end of every day, just spend a couple of minutes uh, thinking back on what went well and what didn't go so well, that that can become a very powerful, but also very sustainable and very healthy um, routine to, to get into. And th those are the four steps of make time. Awesome. And we're going to dive into each step. But it, you, you had used the word perfect before, which made me think of perfection. And in the book, I love how this put, perfection is a distraction. Yeah. That's true, and this this can manifest itself in so many ways. You can, you can. Um, you know, read a book about productivity and become obsessed with perfecting the application of that productivity system. You can um, uh, have a, a tool that you're using, something like a, a project management app, and you can become obsessed with getting it perfectly configured. Um, uh, you can become obsessed with being perfectly healthy, you know, uh, holding yourself to an unrealistic standard. Um, but, but all of these things, uh, really are distractions from the why they're distractions from why yes. we want to do those things in the first place, which is to feel like we're making good use of our time, our limited time that we have, uh, here on earth. So from there, since we're talking about limited time, let's dive into highlights and take sure. us through maybe the three strategies in their urgency, satisfaction, joy. Yeah. So Again, the, the, the big idea with the highlight is to choose one thing that you want to prioritize and protect every day. 
Um, and we suggest three different strategies for coming up with that highlight. Um, one is urgency, and that is really to just look at uh, what what you actually have to get done that day. So that might be the the design work you need to do, the presentation that needs to get done, the um, the proposal you need to write up for work. Somebody's expecting it. There's a deadline attached. And instead of trying to squeeze that very important work into the cracks between meetings or finding that you get to the end of the day and then there's no time for it, um, the, the urgency strategy allows you to make it your highlight and really, truly make time for it. Make that the, the focus of your day. The second strategy is called satisfaction. And it's all about activities that nobody is asking you for or expecting you to do, but you know if you do them, they're going to be very satisfying. You, you're going to be glad that you did it, that you put the time in. And at work, a lot of those things are um, they're new ideas. There may be new projects or new initiatives that you think could be really worthwhile for you or your team or your business. But again, nobody's asking you to do that. And at home, it can be um, it can be projects like planting a garden or repainting a room or, or you know, something like um, uh, cooking a meal, um, things that, that really are, um, are productive in the sense that they, that they create some value or they, they move something forward, but nobody is expecting you to do them and, and you're doing them for yourself. The third strategy is it's just joy and it's really just about <laughs> doing stuff that is, uh, that's fun, stuff that you want to do things that may look like a, a waste of time to other people and and have no sort of measurable uh, productivity or, or economic value attached to them. But these are the things that that so often get pushed to the the margins or the sidelines of life. They're the things that we never quite seem to get around to or we feel guilty when we do. And the, the joy strategy uh, of choosing a highlight is really about giving yourself permission to prioritize the stuff that's fun. Um, maybe not all the time, but definitely once in a while, um, sort of as, as a way of just, you know, staying energized and staying human. When, when you highlight, and I'm guessing you highlight at night so you know for the next day, when you highlight, how do you decide? Is it going to your gut? Is it going quiet? What makes you know, ah, this is the thing that I want to work on tomorrow? I've been planning my days in this way more or less since 2008, 2009. So for me at this point, it's very intuitive. Um, I do think about it. I do take some time to think about it uh, either the night before or the morning of, depending on what I have going on. But um, it's usually it's usually pretty obvious um, what my highlight should be. And, and again, that's just because I've been, I've been thinking in this way for such a long time. This practice of mine is very, uh, very tuned and very much connected to, to how I feel day in and day out. Um, but uh, I, I think for, um, for folks who are just starting out with this way of thinking, that's where the, the strategies can come in handy, the, the strategies of, of urgency, satisfaction, and joy. Beautiful. So from there, let's, let's go to to-do lists. Why do you both love scratch that? Hate them so much. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, it's, it's difficult because I, I, I have a long and tortured relationship with to-do lists. Yeah. Uh, I used to be really into them. I used to really like them and, and spend a lot of time trying to get them just right and, and manage them and make sure they're perfectly organized and set up and planned. I think that they are uh, at the core of the to-do list is the list, which is a fine idea. It's a useful thing. It's, it's great. People have been making lists for hundreds, if not thousands of years. And that's, that's, that's good. But what we think of as a to-do list today has so many additional features added onto it. It's supposedly this sophisticated tool for or staying productive and doing the things that are important. But I think in reality, it's, uh, it's, it's just another distraction. It's just another thing that we can spend time on that makes us feel like we're doing good stuff, like we're being productive, um, but really we're not. Um, and I think it, it, the worst case scenario with to-do lists, and I, I, I've, I've been there, I've felt this, is that they encourage you to spend time on the things that are the least 
important. They're the littlest things on the to-do list. There's actually research showing that um, you get sort of a, a dopamine rush when you check something off of a to-do list. And so if you think about it that way, you're going to you're gonna choose the things on your to-do list that are the smallest and easiest to complete. And maybe you're going to, when you're constructing your to-do list or putting things on it, you're going to unconsciously decide to put things on it that are going to be easier to check off. Um, and and I found that that the most important work, the things that have made my life better, have made you know uh, improved the the lives or the businesses around me, is those things were not on a to do list. They were not some little thing that I had planned. They were some bigger idea that I had to kind of um, go out on a limb to to pursue a little bit. Beautiful. So what then is a might? I love this. A might do list. <laughs> so a might do list is just a list of stuff, but it's, it's, it's shed all of the baggage and all of the pretense of a to-do list because it's not the thing that you so cleverly said, this is what I must do. It's just stuff that you might do. So it, it can be big stuff. It can be small stuff. It can be stuff that's going to make you money or it's going to cost you money. Mm -hmm. But, um, largely it's a, it's a mindset thing. It's about, uh, being honest with yourself and, Admitting that it's helpful to keep lists of things, but also admitting that uh, that the to-do list isn't the right way to run your day. And so what I do with the might do list is I use that as kind of a, uh, a, a fountain that I can pull ideas from. Um, but every day when I set my highlight and when I schedule out my day, um, I'm making that conscious decision to say, you know, this thing that was on the might do list, or maybe this other thing that, that, you know, wasn't on any list. That's what's, that's, what's important to focus on today. And that's what I'm going to do. And I don't have to be constantly deciding, okay, what should I do now? What should I do next? What, what's the next thing I can check off the list? I, I love it. I have uh, my version of a might do list, a mind map. Oh, I cool. draw out with stick figures. This is as good as I can draw, but it's got yeah. all the top things that I'd like to get done. And sometimes I'll color code. And if I know, I always know my SMP, so I don't even need to have that here. I do write it down on my automatic writing in the morning, but this allows me to visually scan and see like looking across your desk, what's on there, what's most important. And you doodle the most important things toward the center. You put other things outside of it so you can see it at a glance. I love that. How often do you do that? Is it every day? Uh, typically every two to three days. Once it gets filled up, some of them, let's see if I can show you real quickly here. Once they get overstuffed, so that, well, that's not, that one's starting to get really filled in with mm, stuff. I see. Yep. Once it gets that full, I will turn the page. Those things that are important will get copied over. The rest yeah. don't need to be because they're mites. I would love to get yeah. to this, but if it doesn't chase me down, chances are it wasn't that important. Yeah, I love that. That's so cool. That reminds me of something else we learned from our design sprints, which is um, the the power of uh, geographic memory. I don't That's know if you're familiar exactly with this. what we're yeah. doing here. Yeah. So in a design sprint, we would turn the we would turn the walls of the room that we were in. We're in the same room all week, yeah. Monday through Friday, um, with the same team. We would turn the walls of the room into the group brain for oh, the team it. because people, humans in general, are, are really good at remembering, oh, yeah, there was this thing that was over there. Um, I think it's it's one of these uh, traits that we evolved as hunter gatherers for the uh, 185,000 years before we had agriculture. Um, uh, this ability to remember where things are. And, and it, it seems like um, the sketches that you do are really uh, taking advantage of that, that ability as well. Yeah, because, I mean, if, if you ask somebody, and, well, if I asked you at a moment's notice, tell me, that, tell me five things in your fridge. Yeah. Uh, okay. You really want, you want to know? Oh, five things in your fridge. <laughs> uh, there's, there's eggs. Yeah. There's, some, uh, there's some coconut milk. Yeah. Um, there's a pitcher of water. Yeah. There's a jar of um, harissa yep. hot sauce, okay. and then there's a oh, massive amount of kale. Uh, there's a massive amount of kale because we got it delivered in our in, in our box, and there was like three times more than we thought there was going to be. <laughs> Smoothie City, I love it. So exactly. when you did that, my guess is you did not make a list, but you mentally went in and opened the fridge and looked and saw what's inside. That's it. right. Yeah. In fact, if you uh, if you could see really well in the video, I don't know if you could, um, but like my eyes were probably going like over here yep. and then over here. 
Uh, I think that's actually how um, the people who do these memory competitions, you know, where they remember like thousands of digits of, of the number pi. I think that that's one of the techniques they use is to is to put the di- the numbers in different rooms of a building and then they sort of walk through in their in their mind. And it's interesting. So I'm going to jump. I'm going to jump all over the place. We're going to come back to laser in a second. But sure. later later in the book, you talk about Caveman Irk. We used to have, yeah. uh, not used to, we've had on several times, Dr. Michael Merzenich, the uh, father of brain plasticity. Mm. And he talks about how we learn best when we're moving across our environment and we can map things out. So Irk, by moving, has a leg up on everybody because the movement that time away actually serves us, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah. We came up with the, the idea of, of Irk, this character of Irk to represent, uh, a a admittedly quite, um, oversimplified prehistoric human. And, you know, there, there are people who have, who are way more knowledgeable about this people, you know, there are many, many books who've been written about, you know, development of humans over the, over the millennia. But to me, it's quite clear that, if you look at the history of humans, we've Homo, sap- Homo sapiens have been on Earth for about 200,000 years, and for about 185,000, maybe 188,000 of those years, the world didn't really change. Humans were changing; we were evolving, and we obviously continue to evolve. But 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 the world really wasn't changing. So we were adapting to become more and more equipped to succeed and to thrive in the world as it was. And then about 12,000 years ago, agriculture appeared. And, and that's a really interesting history too. It, it, uh, it, it just sort of happened. And when it happened, um, it, there was no going back. Um, and then in the last few hundred years, everything has changed. We have changed our world in ways that we no longer are prepared to to function in really to, to certainly not to, to thrive in. And so to me, when you look at that contrast, when you look at the, the, you know, deep down, we're still, we're still irk. We're still the same humans that we were from a, from a, you know, uh, evolutionary standpoint, um, that we were 10, 15, 20, 50,000 years ago, but our world has completely changed. And so to me, it, it shows that we are deeply out of sync with the the lifestyle defaults, um, spending our days sitting in chairs, uh, using cars uh, to get around instead of walking, um, having lots of artificial light that uh, that keeps us up late and uh, and not getting enough sleep. Um, and so Jake and I created this character of Irk to sort of, sort of serve as a, as a beacon or an inspiration for some of the easy ways that we might change our lifestyle defaults to tap into some of that, uh, that prehistoric energy. So, and movements, one of them, one of the interesting ones that you mentioned briefly, or you, you talked about when you talked about design sprints is, um, is energizing ourselves and fuel food. The food choices we make actually make a big difference. Yeah. The five, uh, categories that, that Jake and I picked out within the energize, energize section are exercise, food, sleep, face to face time and quiet. And, you know, these, these are all the sorts of things that everybody knows you're supposed to eat healthy. You're supposed to get enough sleep, whatever. But we tried to come up with, um, with concrete, simple ways that people could, could improve these things. And, and those are in the book, but yeah, food is, I think, um, kind of a, a microcosm of, of the, the ways in which our world has changed because the foods that we eat today, many of them, uh, you know, they come wrapped in plastic or they're prepared in a factory somewhere. They would not be recognizable to, you know, forget about, uh, prehistoric humans. They would not be recognizable to our our grandparents or our great grandparents. Um, that's how quickly the food system has changed. And so we found in the design sprints that if, uh, if we find, you know, we, we serve to the team, we serve lunch that consists of, of real food, you know, of whole foods, of things that Irk could have realistically gone out and hunted or gathered and eaten. Um, and if that food is served in reasonable quantities, because, you know, again, um, 
Irk didn't exactly have, uh, you know, the, the, the aisles of supermarkets to walk up and down. Food was relatively scarce. And if that food is enjoyed in the presence of others, which again would have been a fact of life of prehistoric humans, we found week in and week out doing these design sprints. And certainly we found for ourselves that the, the impact on our energy is just phenomenal. So let's let's go from there. And that, that makes me think, well, we shouldn't go there too far, but if you had fed them junk food, packaged food, processed food, sugary food, too much food, all of these things, they're going on tilt and you've got no design work going on in the afternoon. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. Yeah. And it's not, a, it's not an if. That's actually what we did the first couple of years when we were running these design sprints. There, there is a, I don't know where this came from, but there is a, there's a picture that I think is in my head, at least it's in, it's in many people's heads of when you think of a team, a creative team and they're, they're in a conference room and they're working on something new. I just sort of picture there's going to be junk food. Yeah. There's going to (laughs) be a pile, maybe a pizza boxes stacked up and, you know, it's just going to be this, this kind of, you know, gross and and kind of, kind of wild environment. Um, but that, that environment is not at all conducive to to good, thoughtful work that people are proud of, people are happy with, that people want to be doing. Um, and so when we first when we first started sprints, we didn't it wasn't that we thought that junk food was better. It's just that we didn't really think about it. And so we followed whatever was the the path of least resistance. We followed those those defaults. So we'd we'd grab some lunch that was convenient and we'd bring it into the room so that we didn't waste any time. And, um, if the, if the office that we were in, if it had a, um, you know, a bin of, of potato chips, you know, as a snack, then yeah, people would just grab those, um, in between, you know, in in a break and, and be munching on those as we were working. And, um, and we started to notice that at the end of each day, uh, energy would plummet. But then at the end of the week, there was this compounding effect where that sort of that, um, that downward slope of each day seemed to get worse and worse and worse. And by the end of the week, everybody was basically in like zombie mode, just sort of like, uh, there, but, but not really alive, not really there. Um, and, and so we started to, to change the kinds of foods that we, um, offered to people and the, the way that it was served. So we, we started leaving for lunch, um, going to at least sit outside the conference room, even if it was just in a different part of the office. Make people walk a little. Make people walk a little, sit around a table so that instead of trying to, you know, eat something while you're doing some work, be face to face. We found that face to face time uh, really gives people a lot of energy and takes them away from their work, which is which is very helpful for a break. Um, but so I, I could go on and on, but there were just a lot of things like this that we that we learned over and over again. Awesome. And and people get to dive into the book to learn more. I'll go through some of the other categories here. Let's talk about laser and creating barriers to dis- distraction. Where do we start with this? Yeah, um, <laughs> the place that we started was as designers in the tech industry creating a lot of these infinity pool apps. I worked at YouTube and Jake uh, was a designer for Gmail at, at Google. Um, and so, (laughs) yeah. And, and, and so we, we really saw from the inside some of the things that make these apps so compelling and so distracting at the same time, um, the corporate culture of tech companies in many ways embodies a lot of the challenges of the, the busy bandwagon. It's, um, because it's a, it's a high tech uh, fast moving culture. There's an expectation that you're going to be online all the time. You're going to be very responsive. There's a lot of meetings. And so we were in this really unique position being able to see how the sausage was made, uh, um, to use a common expression. Um, but also trying to, trying to figure out how to thrive in this very, very intense, uh, and, and distracting work environment. And so what were a few of the key pieces that you put in place or that you would tell others when it comes to laser? Where did, where do we start? Well, by far the, the most helpful thing that Jake and I have done is to uh, remove infinity pool apps from our phones. So the, the distraction free phone, um, and for some people, that is a great place to start. Some people really do well with kind of a 
kind of a cold turkey approach. And I don't even want to call it cold turkey because, you know, you remove Twitter from your phone, but you can still use Twitter on the computer. You know, you remove email from your phone, but you can obviously still, you know, you need to still do email on the computer. Um, but there's something so amazing about removing these most, uh, most compelling, most distracting, most addicting apps from the thing that's literally on you all the time. If you think about uh, somebody who's um, maybe a, a problem gambler, somebody who's addicted to to slot machines, um, where would you want to live? Would you want to live next door to a casino? No, that would be disastrous, right? Because the no matter how strong you are, no matter how good things are going in your life, that temptation is always right there. Um, it would be better to live across town. It'd be better to live in a different city, to be in an environment where you don't have to make the decision not to give in to these things that are, that are so tempting and so available. Um, and that's really what a lot of our tactics in the laser section are all about. Um, if, if the distraction free phone sounds too intense, uh, we, we sometimes suggest that people identify the one app that is most likely to kind of suck up their time. We call it their distraction kryptonite. Yeah. Uh, so it's the, you know, maybe it's a, a particular group on Facebook or maybe it's it's Instagram or maybe it's uh, some news site that you just are kind of obsessively checking uh, uh, and kind of getting getting sucked into it. And just try removing that one thing. And and don't do it for, you know, don't make a vow to do it for the rest of your life. Um, just decide to to try it. Try it for a day or three days or a week. And I think that, that that's a, a really important, really important part of this book and this framework is the idea that um, we should treat each day as an experiment, that there's all these ideas, there's all these things that we could be doing to make better use of our time. We don't need to do them all at once. We don't need to to commit forever. But if we can pick a couple of things and try them, then we can we can see how it goes. We can see how we feel. There's a few. You're 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 both of you seem really big into timers in the book of using time for you and rather than against you. And I'm a huge fan, but a huge, huge, huge fan. I don't even know if they still actually have an app on the computer of time timer for years. But but yeah. I'll talk I'll, I'll talk about let's talk about time timers. Timers on the internet, like we're now physically going to get, we love this idea from a <laughs> getting rid of EMF in the house. We're going to have a physical timer on our Wi-Fi. And then oh, yeah. you, you even have, and I can guide you through all three of these, a browser plug-in timer to limit your time on Twitter and news websites. Yeah, that's right. Where, where do you want to start? Uh, time timer real briefly because it's such okay. a visual <laughs> cue of being able to recognize time. Yeah, the time timer is a really, really brilliantly designed device. Um, it's a countdown timer. It's a it's a colored disc that um, that gets smaller and smaller. It's as if it, it's when you set the timer, it's like a slice of the pie that you're setting, and then that that slice of that pie shrinks. And so you can't um, you can't visibly or perceptibly see it shrinking, but when you glance up every couple of minutes, you notice that the pie is a little bit smaller, or the piece of the pie is a little bit smaller. And so it makes time visible in a way that, uh, that numbers on a digital clock do not. And so, uh, the time timer was, was originally created to use in classrooms. So it's, um, designed for, for children, but we found that it is incredibly helpful anytime you're trying to stay focused on a particular task. And we use them in our personal lives, but we also use them a lot in design sprints to keep everybody kind of on the same page and focused. To me, and, and they used to have one on the computer where you're, you could even choose the alarm at the end. I would have Bessie the cow <laughs> go off. What it did is it taught me what time actually looked like passing because I didn't actually have that full concept. We dive into something, we get lost, so you know what time is. You also know there's a switching cost. There's a huge switching cost for things, and so you become more aware of that, and then it can help you when you realize you're out of time. You realize, wait, I do maybe actually have to shift gears. Yeah, yeah. So let's go from there. Two more real quickly, then we'll, we'll begin to wind things down here. This is so much fun. First off, a timer on the internet. 
Yeah, this is something that Jake came up with and I, I have not tried it actually. Um, but Jake, so, so maybe you, you're familiar with a vacation timer, which is like a little, um, it's a, it's a box that you can buy and you plug it into a, a wall outlet and then you can plug like a lamp into it. And the idea with the vacation timer is that if you were out of town, uh, you can set this timer to, to automatically turn on a light, a lamp, um, at night so that it appears that you're home, right? So to maybe deter thieves or, or, or people from, you know, noticing that you're not there. Uh, and so what Jake started doing is plugging his internet router I love it. into the vacation timer so that every night at about 9.30, I think, uh, the internet would just shut off. It would just completely click off. And so I am personally a morning person, although I didn't start that way. I had to kind of retrain myself and create new habits to become a morning person. But Jake is a, is a night owl through and through. He's got great creative energy late at night, but he often felt that when he would sit down to write or do some design work in the evening after dinner, after his kids had gone to bed, that he would just sort of squander that time. He would waste that time reading the news or checking sports scores or whatever. And so for him, this idea of having the internet just automatically click off was a, a total game changer. And you could use that. A lot of people today have the internet, you know, they have a the little fire stick, the TV on the internet, 4.3 hours a day for the average American. I can't even fathom that. But then yeah. at 9.30 or something, poof, yeah. Right. I mean, that's sort of the, 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 there's two sides of the, the coin, which is, you know, one side is that the reason or part of the reason why there are so many, uh, so many distracting infinity pools is that it's all connected to the internet. So it's all connected to this infinite source of interesting content. But the other side of that coin is like you just said, if you can cut off the internet, you can cut it all off. You know, it's um, people, you know, n not as many people have cable TV, not as many people are using broadcast TV. It's, it's all connected to the internet. So when it's, when it's off, it's, it's off. I love it. No, we have programs, different programs that we share with people. We have a morning program. We have an evening program to help set up the evening to get you to bed earlier, get better night's sleep mm -hmm. for the morning. How hard was it to become a morning person? How much did it change your life? It was challenging, but not super difficult. And it completely changed my life. Um, I was motivated to become a morning person because I wanted to align my schedule more closely with, with my wife's schedule. Um, she, uh, when I started doing this, this was around, uh, probably 2012. Um, she was working at a company where they had a lot of early meetings. And so she was getting up early in the morning and she was getting ready for work and going off to work. And, and I was sleeping in and then, so I would, I would sort of wake up just in time for her to leave and then we'd both go to work and, and I would, I would come home and, you know, she would be home and, um, she'd be, you know, winding down for, for bed and I'd, you know, be on the computer doing some work or whatever. And it meant that, you know, we, we obviously we, we lived together and we lived our, our life together, but we, we didn't spend that much time together during the day and I wanted to change that. So, um, I, I don't have to go through all the, all the different details of it, but, but there were things in the morning that I changed. There were things in the evening that I changed things about our bedroom and how that was configured, removing devices and sources of light Dead that room. Exactly. Yeah. So yeah, that's, you're alluding to one of the tactics in the, in the book, which is to make your bedroom into a bedroom. So it's truly just a, a sanctuary for sleep. And, and that has helped me immensely. But with the thing that was life-changing about it, in addition to feeling like I had that much more time with my wife, which I really um, appreciated and, and continued to, to value, was that I felt like I had one to two sort of free hours that had just, it was almost like they appeared out of thin air. They were hours in the morning that otherwise would, would have sort of been wasted. Um, and, and they're hours that are quiet when there's not a lot of requests or demands coming in from other people. Um, depending on the time zone, sometimes it means maybe there's not, you know, maybe you haven't received a lot of emails yet or whatever. Um, but I use that time first thing in the morning to wake up early, uh, make coffee. And, um, and I usually, I usually schedule my highlight for first thing in the morning so that no matter what else happens that day, um, 
it, it's gravy. You know, I, I made time for that thing that I wanted to do first thing in the morning. And then no matter what else happens, I feel good about the day. Love it. So since you talked about game changers or life changers, then can you tell us what you did in 2017 involving a pineapple? <laughs> Well, Pineapple is the name of our sailboat, um, and we, my wife and I have had, I would say, uh, fairly conventional paths until 2017, which is that we went to good college, graduated in four years, mm -hmm. got a job immediately after, started working, you know, graduated on a Sunday, start working on a Monday or you know, Saturday to Monday type thing. Um, never take more than the standard one week, maybe 10 day vacation. And in 2017, we decided that we wanted to try, um, try kind of resetting a lot of those defaults in our life. Um, exchanging the normal behaviors of a professional living in a city um, for a lifestyle where we would be, we would have the flexibility to live on our terms, to set our own agenda, but we'd also have the responsibility to be, um, to really, you know, have to take care of ourselves, to have to take care of the, the fundamentals of life. And the way we did that was by, uh, leaving our jobs in San Francisco, giving up our apartment, uh, getting rid of most of our things and moving on to our sailboat. We, we moved aboard in um, about a year ago, actually, early October 2017. And we spent the next eight months living on the boat and sailing, traveling um, very, very slowly down the Pacific coast. Um, and we, we uh, spent about four months in Mexico. We were in El Salvador, Nicaragua, Costa Rica, and Panama. And we, um, we finished that leg of our travels in June of this year, so just a few months ago, um, by taking our boat through the Panama Canal. Wow. And we, uh, we, we docked our boat at a marina in, on the Caribbean side mm -hmm. of Panama and, uh, and came to Wisconsin for, um, for the summer and fall, basically for the, for the hurricane season. And then, then you'll get back on the boat? Yeah. In, uh, in December, we're going to head back down there. My wife is taking a class this fall at the university here. Um, and when that is done, we're going to fly back down to Panama. We're going to get the boat all put back together. And we are going to um, head north in the, in the Caribbean Sea. So um, uh, up uh, past, um, uh, th there's some islands off of Nicaragua that we're going to visit that are owned by Colombia, um, the Cayman Islands, uh, Cuba and or the Yucatan uh, near Cancun, Mexico, and then most likely finish up in Florida, go to Key West and, and end up around Miami, Fort Lauderdale area. Woohoo! <laughs> that sounds like fun. All right. My, uh, my wife, Jessica, she's the producer. Baby on the way. Got to ask yeah. a question for parents and their kids. I don't believe you have kids yet, but Jake, your co-author, does. Yes. What advice would you give to parents for making time today? I don't feel like I can really uh, give that advice as a as a non-parent. But for anybody who's listening or watching, um, I I think that there is a temptation to say that could never work for me whether it's because you have kids or because of your job or because of whatever. Um, and I know that there's an element of truth in those types of attitudes, but I also know that um, a lot of these defaults and these things that seem unchangeable are changeable. So if you're feeling that way, you, you, you have children, I think uh, it would be I encourage you to to pick up a copy of the book and check it out because, uh, like like you said, um, Jake does have children. Um, he he has a house. He has you know his his kids are in school. He's got he's got a, a lot of uh, a lot of typical responsibilities. And I think you you might get something from kind of reading how these ideas fit in with the way that that his life with his kids works. Fantastic. So on that note, where can people go to find your beautiful book? Make time. <laughs> And to find out more. Yeah. Well, the book is available anywhere you buy books. So Amazon, Barnes & Noble, uh, a lot of local bookstores have it as well. But um, we have a website, maketimebook.com. 
book.com yep. that has, uh, you can actually look inside the book. We've got a bunch of bonus material, um, some, some links to tools like the vacation timer, the time timer, things like that, that we've talked about. So that's a great place to learn more about the book. Fantastic. If you didn't catch maketimebook.com, come on over to inspirenationshow.com. We'll get you over to maketimebook.com. Couple last questions. First off, I don't want people to leave without a homework assignment. What one homework assignment would you give people to take action today? I would encourage people to try setting a daily highlight. So, so every day, um, and make it like a one week experiment. Um, every day, just spend a couple minutes thinking about what's the one thing you want to make time for. It's not the only thing you're going to do. It's not going to be some crazy life changing thing, but think of a thing that's a 60 to 90 minute activity that you really want to make time for. And then think about how you can adjust your day to do it. Beautiful. Then any last words of wisdom you want to share with people today, John? The, the last thing that I want to say is that I think sometimes it can feel if we're busy, we're distracted. Um, it can, sometimes we can feel like it's our fault because we, you know, all, it, we, we might tell ourselves, Oh, if, if only we could, we could put down the phone, if we could, you know, not check Facebook, if, if we could, um, just go to bed a little bit earlier. Um, and, and what I like to tell people is that if you feel busy and distracted, it's not your fault. It's not because you don't have enough willpower, you don't have enough self-control. It's a function of the world that we live in. It's a function of the defaults that exist. And at the same time, um, it's you're the only person who can do something about it. Nobody cares more about your time than you do. Um, and, and really the key is to start, to start thinking about these things, to start experimenting and see where it goes. John, I cannot thank you enough. This has been phenomenal. I truly love, love, love your book. And um, if we can get people to focus on their time rather than everybody else getting them to focus on other people's times, <laughs> I think we'll shift people's lives. We'll make a difference in their lives. Other people may be able to sail the Caribbean as well. <laughs> right. I mean, people, and it's, it's whatever you want in life, I think time is the essential ingredient to get there. So if you want to be involved in politics, if you want to be a volunteer, if you want to start a business, if you want to travel, if you want to have children, whatever it is, you need time to do it. And so that's why I think it's such an important place to start. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This has truly been phenomenal, John. I can't thank you enough. Thank you very much for having me. I really enjoyed it. You're most welcome. So for everyone out there, this is Michael Sandler saying, be well, have fun, get, make time, and begin focusing on what matters most to you today and shine bright. Woohoo! <laughs> Thank you so much, John. This was phenomenal. Thank you. Yeah, it was great. Really enjoyed it. Thanks so much for watching. If you enjoyed it, be sure to like, like below. Also, leave your comments. Have some real fun with it. Subscribe to our channel where you're going to get more great videos, more interviews coming up. And check out our website, inspirenationshow.com. That's where you'll find tips, blogs, information, videos you won't find anywhere else and useful and helpful resources to really help you kickstart your life and to shine bright. Thanks so much again. Thank you for your support. Like, 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 comment, subscribe. See the website. Thanks so much and have fun. Of course, shine bright. Woohoo! <laughs>